All right, hello guys, how's it going? And welcome to another episode of Winter Thoughts. You guys ate up the last one, so I'm gonna be bringing you guys the most recent updates to the sea surface temperatures, the model guidance looking towards the winter, and much, much more within this video. Anyway, before I get straight into things, be sure to smash that like button, leave a comment down below, and subscribe for more weather-related content. For today's comment of the day, I want to know which winter month, this is a wild guess obviously because they can't say for certain, but which winter month do you think will be the coldest and snowiest in the United States? Let me know in the comments down below which one you think it'll be, and I'll be picking one of those for tomorrow's video. Let's get straight into this video, and first things first, we're taking a look at the sea surface temperatures around the globe. We always do this to start things out, uh, and there's a few things to take note of. Uh, we'll save the Atlantic for a little bit later because we're going to zoom into the North Atlantic, but... We see the blue there in the Pacific offshore of South America. That is kind of that neutral Enso slash La Nina that's developing. It's gotten a little bit colder, but it's still pretty far from being considered a La Nina. We're drawing much later into the year than we anticipated without a La Nina now, and it's just, it's still lingering at a neutral Enso. Now, north of that area, we have kind of a confused PDO. It looks more like a negative PDO to me than a positive one, but it hasn't been able to solidify itself as a purely negative PDO. Uh, it's really struggling to take on that role. There's a lot of warmth right there in the middle of the Pacific, which usually points you towards uh, a negative PDO, but we see a lot of the blues around Alaska, Canada, United States. It's just limited. A PDO basically, when it's in its positive phase, brings warmer than normal conditions to the western United States and western Canada, and it usually encourages a positive PNA, which you've heard me say a lot more, which usually makes things cold in the eastern United States. It's crazy how it's like a domino effect. We see one thing affect another, and then it eventually affects us, uh, but it, multiple things have to happen a along the way. I love that so much about weather, guys, but that's where we're at with the PDO. Don't want to confuse you guys too much, so I'm just going to you know, leave it at that. Let's zoom into the Atlantic though, or sorry, you know what? First, we got to take a look at the seven day change. And as we take a look at the seven day change, there's been some cooling, but also some warming there in our Enso region where that neutral Enso is now located. Again, offshore of Central and South America, we see kind of like zebra stripes of blue and yellow. That is where that, pian or sorry, that Enso is not really changing too much. We see our um, kind of PDO region is confused as well, kind of blues and yellows and blues all over the place. Uh, but let's go ahead and take a look at the Atlantic, and this is the overall temperature anomalies. And as you can see, it's much warmer than normal for the most part, especially there in the middle uh, and near Greenland as well. Uh, there is some blues developing in the Gulf states and some there in the middle, but not too much. Here's the seven-day change, and you can see a lot of blues, especially around Canada, the United States, and Greenland. But these areas are still above normal as far as sea surface temperatures go because they were that far above normal that even with these two to five degree drops, they're still in the above normal area, which means they were even further than that above normal. Probably these areas were likely six to even maybe seven degrees above normal because of the fact that they're still above normal despite that cool down that has occurred. Very interesting stuff here, guys. What we're gonna do in a moment is move on, take a look at our Nino 3.4 index chart and our North Atlantic chart. And then we're gonna move on to the Enso forecast according to the models and from our climate prediction center. Uh, we're gonna take a look at that and then we're gonna get right into the model guidance and why I think these models are very confused and the winter's actually looking pretty cold according to them uh, once you take a deeper dive into their um, tools available to us. All right, now here is our Nino 3.4 index. The last time I updated you guys is when we kind of had that uptick there in the beginning portion of September. Uh, as we move towards, you know, further towards neutral, we've kind of seen a drop off now, but we've been consistently seeing these drop offs and then kind of a rebound back towards uh, the neutral direction. Right now we're at 0 0.3. We need to get down to 0 0.5 and stay there for quite a while to be considered a La Nina. So we're not quite there yet. Uh, it's going to be a very weak La Nina or a neutral Enso this winter. That seems evident at this point. North Atlantic here, you can see it's done some pretty consistent warming with these kind of corrections down. Very odd, but we've cooled down a lot actually recently um, over the past couple of days. Pretty interesting to see. Uh, you're going to want to see some colder than normal conditions near the East Coast for those cold air temperatures to be able to really impact you guys early on in the winter. 
So we're watching for that, obviously. That's the biggest impact. And then also the NAO is influenced by the North Atlantic sea surface temperatures, but I don't want to get you guys too confused here. Here's the model predictions of ENSO from August. This is the same one, unfortunately, that we used in our last Winter Thoughts video because there is not any updates. So we're just going to go over this again. This is from mid-August. And as you can see, they really keep it neutral on average there or very, very weak La Nina there. Maybe a negative point seven or six and that's a very weak La Nina I mean that's on the fence of being a neutral and so uh, but a, a lot of these also keep this within that you know kind of La Nada or neutral and so area there so pretty interesting to see that black line is the exact neutral line by the way the one you see going down the middle the 0, 0.0 line again 0. 0.5 positive 0. 0.5 would be an El Nino and negative 0. 0.5 would be a La Nina or anything below that so as long as we stay within uh, that area we're in neutral and so if we kind of move down uh, below it that's when we would be considered a La Nina. Now here is the early July CPC IRI official probabilistic ENSO forecast uh, and as you can see they were mostly calling for a higher probability of La Nina there in the blues. Uh, the neutral ENSO is the gray one so you can see let's find it DJF down there on the bottom right that is our December January February forecast or better known as our winner. Uh, and as you can see, they had a, about, about a 60% chance of a La Nina and then about a 45% chance of a neutral and so and pretty much a 0% chance of a El Nino. Now, as we move on to the mid-August forecast, take a look at this. Let's find DJF again. There it is down in the middle. And now they have about a 42% chance of a La Nina and then about a 48% chance of a neutral and so. So that has dramatically shifted as you can see, and that chance of a neutral and so just goes up as we move further into uh, next year. Uh, you can see that it gets up as, as high as maybe even 72% or so there towards the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, so that that is interesting to note as well. Now what we're going to do is we're going to move on and we're going to take a look at this model guidance as far as temperatures and precipitation is concerned. All right, now here we are taking a look at the temperature anomaly forecast for December 2021. And I wanted to show this because it makes no sense. Usually, if you see a torch in the United States, which you can see this model is calling for, uh, yellows and oranges only from Maine to Florida to California to Washington, there's not a single spot there that doesn't have orange or above normal temperatures, better yet. Usually when you see this, you need a strongly positive AO, Arctic Oscillation, which causes colder than normal conditions over the Arctic Circle. But, as you can see, there's above normal temperatures over the Arctic Circle, which would indicate a negative AO, maybe even a strongly negative AO at this point, which therefore would cause cold air to pour down uh, into the United States, which you don't see. So this is directly contradicting itself here, uh, and that's why I'm not buying this at all. If we saw this map of the United States, but also colder than normal conditions over the Arctic Circle, that would indicate that this has some very strong um, possibility of being onto something. Here's January, and as you can see, it's a lot of the same. There is some cold over Canada, but it's still just above normal temperatures for the Arctic and the United States. Now, as we move towards February, it's, it begins to make a little more sense because we do see some colder than normal conditions surrounding Alaska, Canada, those areas. So that would kind of be your positive AO going on there. Um, and, and that would allow me to believe at least that there would be a complete torch over the United States. But December, January is not really adding up for me. Now, let's take a look here at why I think it's wrong. Um, another reason, here's the geopotential height. Uh, and actually on this model, we see this pretty frequently. Uh, with the CFS model, actually, where it just calls for a complete torch, you know, every single year uh, in, in, in some circumstances, for sure. But here we are taking a look at the January 2022 uh, geopotential height. And as you can see, it's calling for a ridge out in the Pacific, the, the eastern Pacific, that is, which would usually encourage a trough over the eastern United States. And actually, when we're looking at this geopotential height, there is actually a, a trough over the eastern United States here. As you can see, those blues indicating... Uh, some colder than normal conditions typically over eastern Canada there. But also you can see the black lines really diving down into the eastern United States and ridging up over the western United States and the eastern uh, Pacific there. This would encourage colder than normal conditions in the United States oftentimes, especially at least the north central and the northeastern United States, but we don't even get that. 
Uh, and then in February, it actually gets even stronger here, as you can see, a strong trough over the entirety of Canada, but also pouring down into the eastern United States. Again, the black lines ridge up over the western United States and dive down over the eastern United States. This would almost always cause the eastern and uh, the north central United States to have below normal temperatures. So again, just really not adding up here. Uh, so I'm not buying too much into this. For today's confidence tab, there's a lot of contradicting things going on. There's a lot of wild stuff. We're still in September, mid-September. So our confidence tab is still at a three out of six for now, uh, but we're beginning to get the um, the gist of how this winter should go down as we become more and more certain over the ENSO, the PDO, things like that, as there's not enough time for things to change dramatically. The confidence is going to dramatically go up as we head into October and eventually November. For today's comment of the day, I asked you guys about the two tropical cyclones in the in the United, or sorry, not in the United States, the Atlantic Ocean. And I asked you guys, do you think the one offshore of the East Coast will impact the East Coast? And Brandon Dunn said that disturbance off the East Coast might impact the Outer Banks of North Carolina or maybe even the Mid-Atlantic states, uh, but is more likely than not it will be out to sea. And really, I love this comment because of the fact that Brandon points out the possibility for it to impact some areas like the Outer Banks uh, or maybe the Mid-Atlantic, but also mentions that it is much more likely than not that it does go out to sea. And I think keeping all the options on the table is a beautiful thing. And I think it's really important in weather. How many times have we been led astray by a single model or something like that? I could think of many, many, many instances. That's why it's good to keep every opinion, every option on the table as a possibility and not disregard it. Anyway, with that being said, for today's patron highlight of the day, I want to thank you all for supporting the channel, but especially our platinum patrons, John Benbenek, James Wade, Dovey Nagel, Lerl the Pan, and Donna Carnes. Alongside our diamond patrons, Bill Roberts, Marcus Connolly, Noah Harley, Michael Cotalasa, Catbite, Charles Dennett, Cindy Klein, Mark J, Luke Falego, Garys, John Colisi, Dwight Phelan, and Stephen Krunenthal. If you'd like to be a part of this very awesome patron end screen of the day, you can do so by joining our very exciting Patreon page in the description and in the pinned comments down below. I'd also like to thank our channel members, Hair Farms 1, Catbite, Stephen Fan, and Jeremy Cox as well. If you'd like to join that one, it'll be next to the subscribe button down below. Anyway, thank you so much for watching this video. Be sure to smash that like button, leave a comment down below, and subscribe for more weather-related content. I will see you guys in the next video.